Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Josh Stanton. I'm the head of strategic communications and public diplomacy at the embassy in Washington, D.C. I uh, hope you all are having a great spring semester for those of you who are still uh, in university and hopefully um, enjoying some good weather and getting ready for the end of the semester. Um, we're really excited to have you all here um, to talk about the Marshall Scholarship. Uh, it's something that the British government is very proud of um, and love getting the chance to talk to students uh, across the U.S. Uh, about this opportunity. I'm the uh, the lead across the United States for the Marshall Scholarship on behalf of the British government and our, not just the embassy, but our consular networks. Um, as you probably have gathered by now, I am not actually British. I am American. I am what's called a locally engaged staff uh, working at the embassy. But uh, today you are going to uh, get a bit of an overview from me uh, in the next 20 minutes uh, about the scholarship. We'll talk through uh, the benefits of the scholarship, the application, and what to expect, uh, and go through a little bit of the interview process. And then we're very excited that we've got a, a really great uh, collection of alumni from the program over past years who are going to share their experiences. Uh, and that will be moderated by my colleague, uh, Rachel Guerra, who is the head of press and public affairs at the consulate in Boston. So what I am going to do, oh, so before I get, sorry, backtrack a little bit, um, we will also have plenty of time for Q&A uh, at the end after the alumni session. If you would like to ask a question, please do put your question in the Q&A box that's on the bottom taskbar. Um, we're going to go through uh, and pick questions from there, uh, and we'll air those, uh, ask those live, and Rachel will be asking our panelists that as well. Um, I'll also have the opportunity to answer questions about specific aspects of the application during that time as well. Um, so with that, I am going to load the uh, with a brief presentation to start to go through the overview of the scholarship. And just bear with me. Uh, I am going to load that now. So, um, so I want to talk through the scholarship. Um, so one question that we are are asked pretty regularly is. Who exactly are we talking about when we talk about Marshall scholars? Um, I think there is sometimes a perception that a, a marshal is someone who is strictly seeking a political office, uh, that we're looking for the next president of the United States, or that someone who is uh, sort of in that sort of political science space. And while we would love uh, to have a Marshall scholar become the next president of the United States, certainly doesn't hurt, um, it is actually... Uh, the, the scholarship is much more multifaceted than that. So we have scholars uh, from all walks of life. Uh, we've had scholars who are soldiers. Uh, we've had military service cadets uh, in the Marshall Scholarship uh, since 1980. We have uh, have advocates and activists, people who are passionate about issues uh, and looking to world, make the world a better place. We have innovators. Uh, many of our marshals are aspiring innovators and entrepreneurs pushing forward big ideas and helping to solve issues. We have community leaders. Uh, we have many of our marshals are civically engaged, and our community leaders who have come to kind of the UK to learn tools about how they can help their communities back home. We also have musicians. We have filmmakers. We have artists, and we have authors who have all come to the U uh, to the UK for uh, to explore their creative potential. Um, but most importantly, uh, the Marshall Scholarship really is a, a diverse community. Uh, it's inclusive of people from all academic, socioeconomic, cultural, and geographic backgrounds. And really, that is what we are looking for with the scholarship. We really want uh, a scholarship classes that reflect the diversity of the United States, that are bringing different ideas, different perspectives, um, and different backgrounds to the UK, because at the UK, uh, it enriches us uh, in the UK. Um, to have that experience with Americans. Um, just a brief history of the scholarship. So it was established in 1953 um, as a thank you by the British Parliament um, for US economic support under the Marshall Plan after World War II. And the idea behind the scholarship was to give back in a small way and enable intellectually distinguished young Americans, so future, le uh, future leaders, who, uh, to study in the UK, become immersed in the country, and, and meet its people. Um, that first class in 1954 uh, consisted of 12 students, uh, including four women. And to, uh, this is actually the Marshall Scholarship is actually the first co-educational uh, national scholarship in Britain's history. So from the very beginning, uh, the scholarship has really been striving to be sort of as inclusive as possible. Um, the scholarship provides a lot of really great benefits. Um, to, uh, student, to American students who come to the UK and study under the program, provides full payment of tuition, uh, covers airfare to and from the United States. 
we typically have an orientation for, the, for our departing scholars in Washington, DC, and then we fly you over to London. Um, so all of that is covered uh, by the Marshall Scholarship. Uh, we provide a living allowance um, for those of you who are you know, getting dorms or otherwise living in the country, you're given stipends. Um, this is to cover your rent, your food, um, and also um, going out and exploring the country. Um, and then there's also claimable allowance. So the scholarship provides up to $4,000 a year for things like approved travel in connection with your studies, um, commuter travel, thesis preparation, and shipping your property to and from the United States. Um, so those of you who uh, may potentially get a university in London, there is a slightly higher stipend that goes with those, but otherwise uh, the scholarship tries to provide uh, types of support needed to really have a culturally enriching experience uh, in the UK. So another question we're often asked is, is the scholarship me? Am I someone who could have possibly apply for the scholarship? And the answer in most cases is yes, absolutely. So there are some eligibility requirements uh, to apply for the Marshall Scholarship. Um, you have to have graduated from your undergraduate institution um, after April 2020. You must hold your first undergraduate degree from an accredited four-year institution by September of 2023. So by the time we send, so right now we are looking ahead, this fall cycle will determine the 2024 Marshalls. Mm -hmm. And so you would have graduated, hopefully, by your university by then, by next September, in order to so and start your, your Marshall journey. Uh, you must be a US citizen. If you are not a US citizen, that is totally fine. We have something called the Achieving Scholarship, which is a very similar scholarship scheme that sends students to the UK. So if you are an international student uh, or not yet a US citizen, that's something you may consider. Um, you must have a GPA of 3.7 or higher at the time of application. Now, this is something we get a question about often um, about whether this is sort of a hard requirement. Fortunately, the answer is yes. And it's not so much that we um, are sort of have a hold a hard requirement for a 3.7, but what we find is that the majority of UK universities uh, for their master's and graduate programs and above require a 3.7. Therefore, we wanna make sure that you can get into the programs uh, that you are applying for. And then lastly, you must not have held a degree uh, qualification from a UK university, a GSCE, uh, or have taken your A-levels at a British high school in the UK. If you've studied abroad, however, that is completely fine. Um, if you were a dual citizen, that is also completely fine, but you have had to make sure the majority of your time, uh, your student experience has been in the United States. So there's one of two ways that you can apply uh, as a scholar or as a candidate. Um, you can apply in the region of your permanent home address, or you can apply in the region of your undergraduate institution. So uh, we have a total of eight consulates uh, throughout the U.S. Um, each one of those has uh, what we call a selection committee um, that reviews and will interview the uh, candidates and offer scholarships to students in those regions. So again, you have two ways to apply. So say, for example, I'm originally um, from the state of Michigan. Um, but I live in Washington, D.C. If I, uh, I can either apply in the Chicago region or I can apply in D.C. And really, it's a question of what you are most comfortable with. Um, what we generally uh, encourage is pick the place that is going to be most convenient for you. Because if you are asked to interview for the scholarship, uh, in most cases when it's in, in person, we will fly or otherwise pay for your, tra your travel to the consulate or to the location. Um, now, sometimes if you might be, say, for example, already working in D.C., you might decide, hey, it's easier for me to just take the metro down to, uh, to the embassy. Uh, but it's really just a question about your specific circumstances. There is no advantage or disadvantage uh, to applying in one region or another. It was sort of an equal uh, opportunity to receive the scholarship. It's just a question about your comfort level. Um, there are different routes that you can take uh, to applying for the scholarship. You can either... Uh, complete a one-year scholarship, which is a 12-month master's. This can be research or taught. Um, there is no extension on this. Often, this is a popular option for students who are interested in uh, going on to law school in the United States or maybe potentially starting medical school uh, and want to do a one-year degree before they start. Um, more often than not, most of our scholars go the two-year route, and there's a number of different ways that they do this. You can do two one-year masters at either the same or a different university. Um, or you can do a one two-year master program, or you can do the scholarship will cover at least two years of a PhD. However, there's some specific requirements uh, if you do the two-year route. Uh, for example, if you do a um, 
if you do your first choice as being either a London school or Oxford or Cambridge, your second choice has to be a school outside of those locations. So the idea is that we are really encouraging you to get out and see as much of the country as possible and experience as much of the, the cultural institutions as possible. Uh, there is also the possibility of completing a one-year master's and starting your PhD in your, sec in your second year or upgrading from a two-year research master's. You can also continue two previous years of a PhD. Uh, there's also a possible third-year extension that you can receive, but you have to uh, get written permission from the scholarship uh, to, in order to do so. So in terms of the application, so our application uh, is likely to open on May 26th. We're just about to confirm that now, but it's likely to, the application will open on May 26th. And there are different application components uh, to this. There will be a basic form and short answer section. There will be uh, three essays. There will be a, a personal statement. There will be a, uh, a leadership essay, and there will be an academic plan. Um, you will be asked to provide your transcripts and upload that to the, uh, the online application system. This is typically uh, can be an unofficial transcript. Uh, it just has to be uploaded by your institution. You need to receive your university's endorsement. So this is what separates sometimes our scholarship from others is your institution has to endorse you for its application process. So a lot of its universities um, through their merit awards office will vet and decide on their own internal candidates and then will spend the summer months basically supporting those candidates in their application and getting them ready to apply. So what I would encourage you to do first and foremost if you are interested in the scholarship is go to your local fellowships or, or, or scholarships office um, and talk to them first and foremost. They can be the ones who can really kind of help you um, and then kind of give you a, a better idea of sort of their process for selecting internal candidates. And then lastly, it would, we require three letters of recommendation. Um, so what we really encourage is go to people that really know you and really understand you. Um, so this might be a professor that you've worked closely with and conducted research. It might be a, uh, a boss or someone that you've worked with or internship uh, intern with that can really speak to your leadership, your skills, but you really want someone who is going to go to bat for you and really advocate for you. Um, and that is just enhances uh, your application. So one big challenge that we have that I think students face is uh, we are coming obviously from a US system. The UK system is a little different than the US system. And so sometimes it can be a little daunting to think about where do I even start when it comes to picking uh, a UK university? So we have a few helpful tips. Um, one is uh, in terms of choosing a university, we just always encourage do your research. Um, why you choose to apply to a university matters a lot to our selection committees. Um, so we really encourage you to conduct thorough research on the programs in your academic field uh, and choose a school that you think will best support your academic and professional goals. Um, talk to professors. So uh, UK universities are home to some of the world's leading researchers and professors. They absolutely do not mind uh, student prospective students reaching out to them. So if you want to reach out to a, a, a professor you've uh, come across who is doing really great research that you're interested in, reach out to them, get their advice, or seek get assistance from them in developing a research plan. Um, consider universities outside of London and Oxbridge. Sometimes the best programs for you might not necessarily be uh, in the Oxford or Cambridge or some of the places that we would immediately think about when we think about a UK university. So there is an absolute opportunity to get a more culturally enriching experience by going to other parts in the country. We really encourage you to consider that. Um, develop an academic plan. Um, so really setting out why you've chosen a particular academic plan, how it relates to your academic goals, but also your professional goals. The selection committee really wants to see that you have put a lot of thought into how to make the most out of your time in the UK. And then remember, you can apply anywhere. Um, so the scholarship, there are 197 uh, universities in the country, and that means there are 197 opportunities for you to study in the UK. You're going to study at pretty much any university uh, in the country. And we host, we hold uh, partnership agreements with a number of universities and institutions. Um, this is available on our website. So um, once, if you're interested in kind of looking through this list more uh, more closely, uh, I would welcome you to, to, to visit. But essentially, this is just a sense of all the schools that we have partnership agreements are. And what this means essentially is these schools, because they are so interested in getting bright young Marshall scholars to their school, they agree to partially or fully subsidize the cost of the scholarship. So when that happens, that means we have more money as a British government to create more scholarships uh, and offer over a particular year. So 
do look through this list, give uh, and do do some research, look through and see what is the right program for you. So as you do the application and as the committee members themselves are, re are looking through your application, they're gonna look at three criteria for grading you. They're gonna look at academic merit. So providing, seeing if you've in your application have shown evidence of strong and relevant academic background, a knowledge of your proposed courses and study and, and supervisor. So like we said, having an academic plan in place, looking at the quality of programs of study. So not just that you have done well during your time as an undergrad, but have you taken classes that really make sense in the context of what you've told the committee is your plan in the UK? And have you really sort of demonstrated that you've challenged yourself in your time as an undergraduate? And then, uh, as we mentioned before, the quality and breadth of your recommendations, rec making sure that these folks are really going to bat for you in your application. Um, the second is leadership potential. So it's the ability to deliver results, uh, showing, a, uh, showing evidence of a strength of purpose, of creativity, and a self-awareness about yourself and how you fit sort of in the, in the broader scheme of your academic area. Um, and then lastly, ambassadorial potential. And then this is a slightly confusing one um, because I think it's sometimes folks can conflate this with leadership potential. But what we mean is that we are looking, the scholarship at, it, at its bare bones is really about identifying folks who can be um, linked and, and sort of ambassadors for the UK. So the idea is, British government provides you with a scholarship. You come to the UK. You serve as a sort of cultural ambassador uh, on behalf of the United States to Britain. You're meeting Brits. You're helping them understand American culture. And in return, what we hope is when you go back to the United States, that you'll be in a way an ambassador for the UK. So you'll be advocating and sort of positive on the on the relationship that these two countries have together. Um, and that hopefully your time in the UK will have been positive uh, enough that you will stay connected with us. Um, and um, and support sort of opportunities to to strengthen the relationship further. Uh, so this means then having some knowledge of US UK relations um, doesn't mean you have to know the full history. Certainly doesn't mean we want you to uh, quote Winston Churchill in your application. Uh, please don't. Uh, I, I would absolutely encourage you not to do that. Um, but just demonstrating that in your area of interest that you know how the US-UK relationship fits into that. So if you're interested in climate change, for example, and want to study in that space, having an understanding of what the US and UK are doing on climate change and perhaps where they're cooperating, that is an example of where we want you to show some knowledge. Um, lastly, showing a, a evidence of an interpersonal skills and then the ability to engage with others. Um, so in terms of the scholarship timeline, uh, typically our application deadline is in the last week of September. So there are actually two deadlines that you will hit. The first one is your deadline, the candidate deadline, where you will submit your application, uh, which can be found on the Embark website. And then two days later, there is the deadline for your institution. And that's the deadline where they have to submit their endorsement letter that officially endorses you. And then your recommenders also have to upload their recommendations into your uh, file by that period. We then go to our uh, committees. <clears throat> we have a number of reading committees then. We'll look through your first round application. Uh, they will determine which uh, candidates they want to advance. And then we have something called a shortlist meeting. And essentially, these this is the opportunity for the, the committees to sit down, talk about the applications as a whole, talk about the merits. And then what they'll do is basically advance 18 to 23 uh, scholars per region uh, and invite them to interview. You'll be sent to interview uh, in early November, and then we expect to announce the winners in early December. However, you will find out whether, if you have interviewed, you will find out before Thanksgiving uh, whether you have received a scholarship offer or not. So the interviews are 30 minutes long uh, at your at the either the embassy uh, with me or at your local consulate. Uh, the travel costs are covered by the Marshall Commission. Um, we do not, unfortunately, we do not cover the cost of international flights. However, um, we typically find that most universities will be willing to pay for your international travel because they are so keen on uh, securing Marshall scholarships. We are also looking uh, at potentially uh, allowing international students to continue to conduct interviews virtually. Um, we'll have more information on that as we get closer to the deadline. Um, all committee members are American and most are Marshall alumni, so that, but it's not a requirement. But what that means is they all know what it's like to be in that chair uh, and, to, uh, and to be answering questions from a committee. So they are not trying to, to, uh, to get you to stumble. They want you to succeed. 
And so, but they're just really interested in kind of hearing from you and hearing about your story and why the UK can help you on that journey. And then all thematic areas of expertise are covered <clears throat> by the committee. Uh, so you are guaranteed that you have at least one member of the committee will be sort of from an economic, from a career field that aligns with your area. So we have someone that covers STEM, like sort of physical sciences, uh, the medical sciences, someone that would cover social sciences and the arts and humanities. Um, so at least two people uh, on those committees each will review your applications, and that's before we even get uh, to the shortlist. So just quickly look at the uh, application cycle from last year at a glance. Um, we had a pretty sort of, I would say, diverse spread of uh, applications from different academic areas. And this is just, again, to underscore that we really look for scholars from uh, all backgrounds. Um, but roughly 50% came from social science related academic uh, fields, but a quarter came from STEM, uh, roughly 20% from students interested in the arts and humanities. And then we had about almost 11% of students who were interested in pursuing degrees relating to the medical sciences. Um, we typically find, uh, sorry, this is actually from 2023. This is typically find that our, where the students are coming from, the candidates that are selected are also pretty equally spread. So last year's cycle, uh, a, a slim majority came from research institutions and liberal colleges, but nearly a third came from state and public universities. We had uh, roughly 12% come from Ivy League schools. And then uh, interesting last year, we had roughly 18% come from service academies. In terms of where they're going, uh, last year, about roughly half the class went to Oxford and Cambridge. Uh, a little over a quarter went to other London universities. Um, and then the remaining students went to universities throughout the country. Um, I'd say in most years, we have students going to universities in Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Last year was a bit of an aberration where we did not have any students. But again, I would absolutely encourage you to consider uh, universities uh, in those parts of the country. Um, so just to wrap up, in terms of resources, absolutely encourage you to uh, go on the Marshall Scholarship website for more information. There is an online course finder tool for those of you who want to start your research in the UK universities that you can visit. Here's the link. This will be available as a as a YouTube video um, that I will put on the MSC website after, or MSC YouTube page afterwards, but it is also on the MarshallScholarship.org website. Um, absolutely encourage you to visit University's Fellowship and Merit Advisor Office and start talking to a fellowship advisor about the scholarship. Um, we do post Marshall's content on uh, the Marshall Scholar uh, Twitter account, as well as UK and USA. Both of those also have Instagram accounts. And then do email us at apps at marshallscholarship.org. Happy to answer your questions. What I'm going to do now is I am going to stop sharing this presentation. Um, as again, I am happy to answer questions about the application process, but I'm going to do that at the end with the Q&A. But I want to take this opportunity to introduce Rachel Guerra, who is our head of our press and public affairs office and our consulate in Boston. She's also the lead on Marshalls for the Boston Consulate, and she is going to moderate our, our panelist session. So Rachel, take it away. Thanks, Josh, and hello, everyone. We have some amazing alumni on the line with us. So I see we have Katie, Dylan, and Abby. So if you guys could all turn on your cameras. We're waiting for Katie, but she's getting there. I'm sure about it. Awesome. Well, I'm going to I apparently kick can't because the oh. host, sorry, Rachel, the host stopped my camera, so I can't turn it back on myself. No worries. Well, Josh, we're looking at you to handle that on the back end. There, there it go. is. There, yep, it's on the way. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you all so much for joining us here today. Um, I figured we can start off with just some introductions for each of you. If you could tell us what year you were a Marshall Scholar, where your U.S. institution was, what your U.K. institution or institutions were, and what you studied while you were there. And I'm really curious what region you, rece you received your scholarship from. So I'm just going to go left from right on my screen. So Abby, I'm going to go with you first. Sounds great. Thank you all for hosting. Uh, glad for the opportunity to join the panel. So I, and I might need a refresher in the middle of all of those things, um, but I was a 2018 Marshall Scholar. Uh, I spent, well, I graduated from Purdue University in 2018, studied engineering. Um, and while I was in the UK, I spent my first year up at the University of Edinburgh studying computer science. And then I spent my second year down in London at University College London doing international relations. Um, I interviewed in the Chicago region. So I was from, I'm from Indiana and I went to school in Indiana. So I did not have a choice, um, which if some of you find yourself in that situation, it makes the whole process a little easier. But I think that's everything. 
Yeah, that's it. Thank you so much, Abby. Dylan, I'm going to go to you next. And it's nice to see you again, Dylan. I don't think I've seen you since last year's Marshall Summit. So hello again. Yeah, good to see you too. Um, yeah, so I'm Dylan King. So I'm a 2020 Marshall Scholar. So against the pandemic, that means that I interviewed immediately before the onset of the pandemic, and then the pandemic started, and then I moved to Britain. So I finished my undergrad degree at Wake Forest in 2020, which is a liberal arts university in North Carolina, which is also the state that I'm from. So like Abby, I didn't have much of a choice, but I was happy with that. So I interviewed in Atlanta. Um, 2020 to 2021, I spent the first year of my Marshall doing part three of the mathematics tripos, as they call it at Cambridge. So it's a one year taught masters in math. And I really like math. So then for my second year, I did another one year math master's degree, but this time by research at the University of Bristol, um, which is sort of just on the English side of Wales um, for your geography. Um, and then I came to Caltech, which is where I'm at now for my math PhD. I think that was everything. Awesome. Yes, thank you. Katie, let's go to you now. Sure. Um, so I'm like the dinosaur here. I um, am a 2008 Marshall Scholar, and I do know that means a few things have probably changed since my time. Um, so I was an undergraduate at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, where I did a BA in journalism and a minor in political science certificate and in international relations. Um, and I'm from Michigan originally. Um, and so I actually interviewed in the Chicago region. Um, I think, I don't know, my scholarship advisor seemed to think that UMass was like the little sort of, you know, the what is it, the poor stepchild in, in the region with, you know, all of the really um, esteemed Boston universities. And so they advised me to go to the Midwest. Um, and that was cool. It was cool to go to Chicago. Um, my studies in the UK, I did my first year at the University of Sussex, and I studied global political economy, got an MA in that, and my second year I went to LSE, London School of Economics, and did an MSc in social anthropology, and I'm currently living in Cape Town, South Africa, where after about 12 or 13 years working in education nonprofits and philanthropy organizations, I work as an independent consultant in that space. Amazing. Thank you. And since you since you mentioned what your fellowship advisor had told you at UMass Amherst, and as I am in charge of the New England scholarship, and it's my job to advise fellowship advisors to apply here in New England. Uh, no, I think that's a really interesting point to hear that because trust me, you're not the only one I ever hear it from. I know that New England has a reputation, I think, for being a bit of a harder region to apply in because we do have a lot of the Ivies here, but I really like to assure people I don't necessarily think that's the case. I don't think our committee members think that's mm. the case. We really try and weigh the applications all very evenly. And also I think the Ivies make those suggestions sometimes. I can't say that for sure. So <laughs> maybe that's a little more of a reason to encourage you applying back here in New England. The more applications I get, I am oh. personally happy, but I won't try and steal too many from my other colleagues out, out West and everywhere else. Well, great. Thank you all so much. Um, I'm gonna start off kind of from the beginning of how your Marshall journey started. So I wanna start off with your experience applying for the scholarship. First of, all, first of all, how did you learn that the scholarship existed? And what was the application process like from your perspective from learning about its existence and getting all the necessary materials together, working with your institutions? I'm happy for whoever to go first, but I'd love to hear all of your perspectives. Okay, I I'll pick start. someone. Dill, oh, yes, yeah. you unmuted. So, Go ahead. I uh, when I was a student at Wake Forest, I um we had a fellowship advisor. I like like lots of other universities. Um, and at some point during my junior year, I sort of got an email just that was sent to all students with relatively good GPAs that said, "Hey, these are some opportunities that you might want to think about." Um, and up until then, like I said, I really just enjoy math, and so I'd sort of said in my head okay, when I finish undergrad, I'll just start a math PhD. And for no particular reason, I just said I would do it domestically. Um, but when I got this email, I said, okay, maybe there are some um, nice thing, nice postgraduate degrees in Britain instead. And so, you know, you hop online for a few minutes and you find the yeah, other are some very nice postgrad degrees in Britain. And so that like the ones at Cambridge and Bristol. Um, and so I really hadn't heard about it until then. And then I sort of you know, looked at it in some of the other postgrad awards um, and said, yeah, these would be really nice to apply to and then do before I start my PhD. Thanks. Um, Abby, I'll go to you next. 
Yeah, so I was fortunate that um, Purdue also has a scholarship office, um, and I worked heavily with them. I think uh, over the course of my junior year, I really treated it like a class because it takes approximately that amount of hours and work um, to do it well. You have to do a ton of research into UK universities, I think, um, both to convince yourself and understand why it's useful for you. Um, because unless you've convinced yourself of that, you're not going to convince the application committees. Um, and also to like talk to former applicants or uh, former scholars or people who work in your field who have these relevant connections to you. Um, so I treated it like a class. It took a lot of time, but it was probably the single most valuable, the application process was the single most valuable um, experience of my undergraduate career for teaching me what I wanted to do, helping me learn to articulate that and beginning to understand what the field that I was interested in looked like and who the major players in that field were. Um, so I cannot commend even the application process itself enough as like a tool of self-discovery. Thank you, Katie, on to you. Yeah, uh, I was probably at first I was in trouble with the scholarship office because I approached them way too late. So I'm just being very honest <laughs> because I spent my full junior year studying abroad. So I was sort of the opposite of Abby and I wouldn't advise being like me. I'm just going to say that right up front because I had to do all the work that Abby would have done over like a year in a summer. Um, so, so a very, very condensed period of time. And it was quite tricky because I was away until, um, yeah, until the summer right before my senior year. Um, I'd had a professor kind of say to me before I went away end of my sophomore year, hey, you should think about this thing. And I kind of filed it for later. And then when I got back, kind of looked into it, approached the scholarship office. Um, yeah, so initially she was like, oh, you're a bit too late. Um, but then I, I said, no, I really want to do this. And, and once she saw that I was really serious about it, I got a huge amount of support from the fellowship advisor. Um, yeah, I mean, I think what, what stands out still, it was, it was a while ago, but what I remember really well was the interview. So once I was, I was selected to go to an interview, um, the fellowship office arranged three mock interviews for me and they pulled in professors and they forced me to practice and it was terrifying and it was really hard. And I got asked these insanely difficult questions, but that was definitely one of the most, um, you know, when you talk about growth experiences, Abby, like things that really challenged me and, and forced me out of my comfort zone. That was really, really valuable. And I think um, I definitely wrote like a million drafts of my personal statement. I don't know if I worked harder on any other piece of writing that I did in undergrad. And I was a journalism major, so I wrote a lot and I, I worked very hard to, to write well. Um, but I think that was something I really invested in and, and really just wanted it to not sound generic and to also really authentically reflect me. Um, yeah, so that was, but I, I when I got to England, I, I remember meeting other people, other marshals who said, oh yeah, you know, at my university, they started prepping us freshman year and figuring out who's going to apply for what. And I was like, yo, no, I, I wasn't on that track at all. And I mentioned that just to, to say that, like, I, I wouldn't want people to say, oh, I haven't been prepping for this since my sophomore year or since I started. I don't know if this is for me, because actually, if you really are interested and you're willing to put in the work, um, even if you're just starting, you know, now and you're going to be going into your senior year, year next year, you shouldn't think you're too late or not, not prepped or not eligible. It's more about are you willing to put the work in um, and less about it, if it's been the whole focus of your entire undergraduate career. I think that's a really good point because I mean, Abby, you kind of already talked about that junior year, you spent your entire time working on this. And I that was going to be a follow up question I had just when when would you suggest students should best prepare themselves to start thinking about this? Um, of course, sometimes it just pops up and you don't know what exists until it ex you know it exists and there's only so much you can do, but you just do your best. But is there an ideal time that you think students should maybe start to think about this? Is it as early as their freshman year, even if that means necessarily making sure they match the necessary requirements like a GPA? What do you guys think about that? Hmm. It's such an interesting question. I mean, I'm just going to go like gut response because I think that the kind of person who, who I found made up my class of Marshall scholars was someone who was like really curious and really liked challenging themselves and really had a deep passion for something. Um, and I think if you're that kind of person um, and, and a huge work ethic, like willing to work hard, intelligent, but there's so many different kinds of intelligence. And there were people in my class who had all of these different kinds of intelligence and and um, and curiosity. So I think if you've approached university like that generally, 
um, you could find out in your junior year about the Marshall and you may well be set up. So, so I don't, um, I think if you start thinking about it freshman year, I'm sure that could be beneficial. You could think about what kind of, you could make decisions that might, that might help you, but I, I don't think there's like a moment that it's too late. That would be my, my gut response. I think the kind of people that make, um, that I met on the Marshall scholarship are people who are curious and really hardworking and like to challenge themselves. Awesome. Yeah, yeah I, I would Dylan. agree. I would agree entirely. Um, like, I think, I think it's better to, so for myself, I think I was sort of in between the other two panelists. Yeah. I sort of, in my junior spring, sort of sat down and said, okay, like, do I want to, you know, am I going to apply for this thing? And, and I had good grades, but I, I don't think it's necessarily good to say, well, I'm going to, I'm a freshman, I'm just going to try and get a 3.7 so I can apply for this thing. I mean, you can do that if you like, but I think it's, I think, um, like was just said, well, you sort of give it three years. And then when you sort of look around, you know, you look at your CV and say, oh, okay, you know, I do, I have these good grades. Maybe I should do something with them. Um, because I think that also feeds into another piece of the application that, that my advisor always reminded me of was like, you've actually are, you've already banked the hardest part, right? The hardest part of the application was the, like the three years of undergrad that you've already finished doing all of this stuff, right? Doing all of these projects and getting these good grades. And so, and those just happened. You just have those saved up. Um, so for me, I sort of made a, a plan and thought about who might write my letters um, sometime during the end of my junior year. And I thought that was fine. Can I, can I add something, Rachel? I do think that I struggled with one thing, which was the letters. So I, I mean, I you, had, you I think beat I me four. to it. That was going to be my next question <laughs> was something that you guys struggled no, so with the application. So go for it. No, I think that that was tricky for me because I chose to spend my whole junior year abroad, which is an unusual decision. Many people who go abroad only go for a semester. I really wanted to go for a year. I'm glad I did. Um, and I knew that in doing that, I was making a compromise because I wouldn't have as many um, U.S. professors who I would know well. But I felt like I'd had some really close, good working relationships in my sophomore year. And then I did connect well with a couple of professors at the University of Cape Town who were willing to write a letter. But I think you know, I had to think about like, what is this trade-off I'm making? And I do think that's the one thing to make sure you're thinking about early on. But I think that's also just gets, you know, it's part of having a really fulfilling college experience is having, you know, good relationships with professors who get to know you and understand you, who would be able to write you those kind of letters for wherever you want to go next. Um, but yeah, that part I would definitely think about on the earlier side. Great. Don't be well, like I mean, 80 this... is the takeaway of my panel contribution. <laughs> Well, I think this does lead, and I'm curious, Dylan and Abby, your thoughts, what is a part of the application you guys might have struggled with? I mean, towards the end of this conversation, I did want to ask how you all embrace the ambassadorial aspect, which I know I've heard some students have struggled with that part, similar to what Josh said. So I'm just curious what your experience was. Um, I can go first. So I think, honestly, the hardest thing for me was identifying programs in the UK uh, for the things that I was interested in. And that's because um, I was at a state school that hadn't had a marshal in a whole generation. And so I knew not a single person who had gone to do graduate school in the United Kingdom. Um, turns out that in the elite academic world, this is a very common thing that people go and do graduate school. And so, you know, friends who went to Yale for undergrad or friends who went to Harvard for undergrad, of course, know a ton of people who went to go study in the UK. But me being from small town Indiana and then going to a state school in Indiana knew literally no one who was like related to the United Kingdom at all. Um, and because of that, I had a really hard time um, figuring out like what programs are legitimate in the United Kingdom. Um, and so for that, I think I ended up just eventually like chaining through friends until I found someone who had like studied abroad or lived there for a bit. Um, and like cold emailing a few professors um, or things like that. So I think getting your, if you don't come from circles where other people have gone to do this, it can be hard to just wrap your head around the um, basics of like what are reputable programs. But I do think that that's extremely important information to convey to the committee that you're credible, your choice of a program. Um, if you select like an off the wall program that nobody's ever heard of, I think that's a credibility knock to your application. So I would encourage students to like invest in the networking and the work up front to 
truly get a robust understanding of what the credible British programs in your field are. Yeah, I would say for myself that the most difficult component was the uh, is the writing. Uh, as I mean, I'm not a writer, right? I like I said, I like math, and so I sort of I knew, right? So so like uh, like Katie, I I also spent my entire junior year abroad uh, just for math, right? And so I needed some mechanism to turn like I I really like math, and then I want to go do math in Britain, like into these personal essays and and. Um, you know, comment of, about ambassadorial potential. And yeah, that for me is, of course, I, I didn't do any form of journalism. That was definitely, in terms of hours spent per word, that was the, the most intense piece of writing that I've ever worked on, right? And I would send drafts to people and then say, oh, change this, change this. Um, and so I think for me, that was that was definitely the most. I, of course, I, I can't say but you can't run any experiments, right? So I don't know how any of that would have worked out. But while I was working on it, that was the most difficult piece. Katie, I saw you had your hand. So anything else you want to add? No, I just, I would really echo Abby's point about how difficult it was to navigate and find programs. And I was sort of hoping that 10, 12 years, 14 years down the line, it would be easier because there's so much more connectedness and social media. And I mean, like we didn't have smartphones when I applied for my Marshall. Um, so, so it was different, but I, I guess it just remains hard. And I think your point, Abby, about like the cultural capital, I'm also from a state university, didn't know people that had studied overseas. It's like, I didn't even know who to ask. Um, so that also was really tricky, but I actually just wanted to make a suggestion, which is reach out to Marshalls. So if you have like you can stalk everyone on Twitter nowadays. It's really different. Those opportunities weren't there. Twitter was not invented. I just keep like thinking about how old I am. So um, so I think like, you know, I've had people reach out to me who are saying, I'm thinking about a Marshall. I'm thinking about the program you just, you did according to the website. Um, do you have any tips for me? And I'm always like, even if I'm like, hey, I'm busy. Do you have WhatsApp? Send me your number and I'll voice note you in the car. You know, I'm very, very willing to have that conversation with someone or send them a short email or have a short call. And so I think like, because I noticed the difference. So my first year I had to pick kind of just from that distant research and I did end up picking a really wonderful, incredible program, but it was really hard and I still wasn't that confident it was right till I got there. Um, my second year, I completely changed my plan because I was in the UK. I had the networks. I could talk to all my friends studying the different things at the different institutions. It was so easy to make a really informed choice about my second program because I was now in those spaces. So I think just to say, I think former marshals would be really happy to help out with that. You know, go on LinkedIn, look people up, um, be a creepy stalker. I do think people are willing to have those conversations. So that's just a suggestion I would make. No, I think that's very helpful and very valuable to take away from this. I mean, me in New England, part of my job is to go out to institutions and make that outreach. But something I'm trying to do is utilize our network of marshals more. One, because I'm only one person. And there's a lot of institutions here and it's nice to get some other people, but I don't have the same experience you all had over there. I haven't gone through the application process. I may know how it works on the back end, but that doesn't mean I had, I would have had the answers necessarily to get the scholarship. So yeah, I think you're absolutely right that the Marshall Network is something we need to tap into to just make it a little more accessible to people. So thank you. I have um, one more question on the application process before we head into actually what being in the UK was like. Um, and this last one is, do you guys have any advice for preparing for the interviews? I mean, that's something we actually don't talk a lot about. I don't think we tend to focus more on the application and then actually be in the UK. So any tips you might have that were helpful for you? Any advice on things not to do from your own experience? Um, Dylan, I see you chuckling. So I'm going with you first. Like, I mean, uh, by evidence, I can't give you any great advice for what not to do. I know that my goal when I did my interview was to stay was just to stay relaxed. I just I needed to stay calm, and it helped when I did my interview right there, half an hour long, and the first five to ten minutes was was all math. They let the math person and I go crazy, and then they said, "Okay, no more math." But I had already sort of said I had become comfortable in the room, and I appreciated that greatly. Um, like another panelist, like oh, I'm sorry, I can't remember which of you said this earlier. My undergrad institution did a practice run. We just did one beforehand. And honestly, that was orders of magnitude worse. So if you have a practice run that goes poorly, don't, don't let that get into your head. 
um, because they were mean, right? People, my advisor, people who I thought liked me in my undergrad were mean to me in an effort to sort of get me ready. And I, I could see where they were coming from, but in reality, it wasn't that bad. So yeah, I would just try and stick home. I can jump in because I actually had the opposite experience. Um, so my undergrad also did one um, mock interview for me and it went great. And then the committee was really mean to me. <laughs> um, it was run by a lawyer who was like pretty aggressive with the questions. Um, they were like very directly challenging to me. Um, my background at the time was in like national security and surveillance. And I remember one of the questions right out of the gate was should Edward Snowden be brought back to the US and tried for treason? Um, they were very political. They were very aggressive. I think that just goes to show you that I walked out thinking they absolutely hated me. So I think that just goes to show that the selection committees and the different regions are all extremely different. It's extremely hard to predict what they will be like. Um, you practice for what you can through these mock interviews. Um, but outside of that, just you just got to be yourself. Um, and I think even if you walk out feeling negatively, that is no indication of what they actually think of you. Um, interviews, just a crapshoot. So you do what you can to prepare. Um, and then other than that, I think the results are out of your hands. Yeah. The, the one piece of advice I remember being super useful was, um, and this might have been specific to my field because I was journalism and political science, but I had um, some professors who said you need to read The Economist every week and you need to read The New York Times every day for a month before your interview. And it was like quite a specific prescription. Um, but I actually, I did find that really useful because I did feel... And I, I didn't read everything in The Economist every week. I did not have time for that. But I, you know, I went and bought it and made time. Like it's almost that thing of treating it like an extra class for a month where I'm going to put a few extra hours every week into reading the stuff that I dipped into but wasn't as diligent about most of the time. But I then remember in the interview, they asked me about a headline from that morning, something about Pakistan. And I hadn't seen it. And I was like, ah, what do I do? And I, I just had to be honest. And I had to say, look, I actually, I can't comment on that because I haven't had the chance to read that this morning, but what I've been picking up about what's going on in Pakistan until now is X and Y and Y. So I think you have to be really honest. If you don't know an answer, do not bullshit because people can smell when you're not being authentic, when you're not being yourself, when you're faking it. And it's much better to say, I honestly, I'm really not sure. I would love more time to think about that than to pretend because I think people are looking for authenticity and courage. I mean, we had a debate, what was the debate about, you know, they really challenged me on some, I had this sort of very idealistic journalistic integrity and someone saying, but if it sells a lot of papers, maybe you should be putting Britney Spears on the cover or whatever, you know, it wasn't Britney Spears. And having that debate and being able to say, I'm, I'm confident to, to have a debate with you around this. Um, but yeah, just be okay that you won't know everything no matter how well you've prepared. Um, but do spend a bit of extra time reading up about things in your field because it will all kind of layer on ahead of time and, and seep in and you'll feel more confident going in. Dylan, go ahead. I saw you had your hand. I just wanted to quickly tech on that. As, and in my field, we don't interview very often. So I was not a practiced interviewee. And so I had not, for example, probably done what I should have done and prepared lots of canned answers to common questions, right? If they had asked me, uh, what's your greatest weakness, right? I think lots of people have that like ready to roll. I, I did not have any of those and none of those like canned questions were asked. So I wouldn't worry too much about those. Awesome. Well, I appreciate all of this insight and something that I can offer from my perspective on the admin side is, yeah, I definitely try and encourage students to try and just be their authentic selves. I mean, something I like to tell candidates before they go into their interview is that, look, you are interesting and they're really intrigued by what you want to do. That is why you're here. They just want to get to know you more and whatever those methods may be. It varies from intense questioning to maybe some really specific focuses on maths or wanting to learn about one candidate in the past talked about how their passion for um, Viking graveyards. So all the different things that can really help stick and land and uh, help land an interview well are always really interesting to find out. Um, I'm going to switch to the UK first and we're going to have more opportunity for Q&A from the audience. So I'm going to save some of those questions for later, but how how was the move to the UK for you all? Were there any challenges? Was How was the cultural difference? Um, any advice you have on that for future scholars?
Abby, you're smiling. You're going first. Sure. Um, yeah, so the move the first year obviously felt a lot bigger and more difficult than the move between years between Edinburgh and London. Um, I think what's helpful is that you're moving both as part of the Marshall cohort. So there were uh, three other scholars who moved to Edinburgh with me. Um, and then you are also obviously a part of your university cohort. Um, so those will both give you two footings to build a community in. Um, I think uh, there were some marshals who kind of chose to just stay close to the cohort, but one of the benefits I think of not being in the Oxford, Cambridge, London hubs is that it almost forces you in a way to go out and make friends with other people who are there. So um, while I was in Scotland, I made friends with a group of uh, women from Saudi Arabia who are in my program, um, and they remain some of my very closest friends to this day. Um, I have like visited them in Saudi, um, and I think like the relationships you build with um, friends in the UK, where I still have friends, uh, friends who are from all over the world, are an immense benefit. And you're kind of <clears throat> forced into doing that if you take yourself out of what we call the like golden triangle of the Oxford, Cambridge, London schools. Great. Um, Dylan, Katie, who wants to go next? Sure. So, so uh, everything for me was disrupted by the pandemic, right? So even though I was, so I moved directly from North Carolina into Cambridge, and so on paper, it should be a place where there are like dozens of, you know, you can't go to the grocery store without seeing a marshal. Actually, in reality, this wasn't the case, right? But I got very lucky. And so I lived in the college housing, right? So the university furnished house. And so I split a one big house with eight other graduate students. And, and against all odds, we got along really well. Um, and so because we were in the pandemic, we were locked down and everything. And so those, um, like Abby, those are, are still some of my closest friends. Um, and so that, I mean, it was, it was difficult, right, during the pandemic. And, and I couldn't come home for Christmas, right, because I was worried that if I left the UK, I wouldn't be able to get back. Um, but uh, other than that, I, I don't think it's too bad. I mean, I think there are serious cultural differences, but I think uh, if you stay calm, a lot of them aren't as difficult to overcome as they, as they might seem. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think I would just, I just want to echo everything Abby said a thousand percent. So I think I had a really wonderful experience because my first year was at the University of Sussex and there were just two of us in our Marshall cohort that went there. In fact, the other one was just at my house two weeks ago, visiting me for a week um, because we remained friends. And, um, and so I, yeah, I made friends. I had, and things I had this amazing Marshall cohort and we were always taking the train around and visiting and I was sleeping on people's floors in Cambridge and Oxford and whatever. So I had, I mean, I, I traveled all over the UK. I went to St. Andrews, I went to Edinburgh. I visited people, very cheap free way to travel. But I, I had this, um, a lot of English friends and a lot of international friends. I was in a 10 person student house from people with five continents, seven countries my first year. I mean, it was also an incredible experience, I think sim similar to yours, Dylan. And I think just in terms of the cultural um, um, acclimatizing, sorry, that's the word. Um, I think making friends with a bunch of um, British people really helped. So there were several people in my master's program who some had actually done undergrad at the same institution and then gone into the master's program. And I think just in terms of getting the lay of the land and being able to joke about our cultural differences, but also having like a guide who could just help with all these little weird things like what do we call that and where can I buy that and who can cut my hair and whatever. Um, having a few English friends was really, really helpful. Um, and again, going to see them, some of them in August when I go to the UK for a wedding and stay in friends' homes and meet their babies. So those connections really have lasted over 15 years now, which is pretty amazing. Fantastic. Um, my next question is more about the differences in study um, while in the UK. Uh, I don't know for all of you, if you've received any um, additional postgrad degree in the U.S. since, but I guess I'm just really curious, like, how are the academics different in the U.K. versus the U.S., even if you can only compare that to your experience from undergrad? Katie, I'll have you go first. Yeah, um, I found the U.K. master's experience to be much more hands-off than I anticipated or expected. Um, I think that 
I benefited from that in some ways. Um, I mean, you really, I mean, I never have gone to law school, but yeah, I think that there's a degree of sort of independence that you need to learn. It's, there's a bit of a, it's, it's not a sink or swim, like no one wants you to sink, but there really is. Um, I mean, I know when I was at LSE, the rule was that you weren't allowed to show your dissertation advisor any drafts of your thesis in my department. And you were only allowed to have meetings with them until June. They were not required to be available to you at all in July or August when you were doing the bulk of your writing up because they might be off doing their own research. That was the way the calendar went for them. And that just like boggled my mind. I thought, but surely when you're working on your thesis, I mean, when I did my undergraduate honors thesis, I sent multiple drafts to my advisor and he made lots of comments and sent me back to do more analysis. And I, I haven't done further postgrad here in South Africa, but I know many, many people that have. And I, I know that the, the system here is a lot more involved with rounds of feedback and closer kind of working intellectual relationships. So I do think the PhD experience in the UK is quite different, I think, but masters tend to be the ones that I have heard about and been aware of quite a, um, really pushing you to be self-driven and self-motivated in terms of your own learning. And I think there's things I took from that that have been really beneficial um, in the rest of my life. But I think then there's also things that you could, um, there were things I enjoyed about my undergrad where it was a lot more intellectual exchange with professors. Great, Abby, Dylan, whichever one of you wants to go first. I can jump in. Um, I think it obviously varies a ton program to program in some schools. I think like LSE is an example of this fall closer to the American end of the spectrum. Um, the major differences are, I think the volume of work you are expected to do during the semester is much greater in the United States. Um, whereas in the UK, it's much more common to simply have one large examination or a paper at the end of the semester. And that's kind of your only grade. Um, and uh, I'm actually wrapping up law school right now. This is my last week of class and law school in the States follows kind of the British model. So we, we just have one big exam at the end of the semester in most classes. So it's very helpful preparation for that if you do plan to go to law school afterwards. Um, I think the thing that hands off is one way to put it. I found it to be a little bit less um, rigorous and demanding, which I really was glad for after four years of intense undergraduate STEM classes. I was glad to have two years where I could I could have school instead of being, you know, 90 to 95 percent of what I was thinking about all the time, have school be closer to 30, 40 percent of what I was thinking about all the time. Um, and you kind of learn what you're interested in outside of academics um, and you have time to explore and travel and make friends um, and develop new skills and hobbies and things like that. Um, so I really appreciated that model. But yes, you do have to be, as Katie said, incredibly self-motivated and have a vision for what it is you want to take away from your uh, programs. Otherwise, it's um, pretty easy to just kind of skate through and not get much substantive value from them. Yeah, I guess I can I can add with a couple of like very specific examples. So I agree. I echo entirely. It's a more hands off approach. I mean, personally, I found my I found my courses really hard. <laughs> um, but so at Cambridge, right, compared to the US where like when I was an undergrad, and I think in most places, course registration is a very formalized process with many requirements, right? Oh, to graduate, you need at least one of these and at least two of these. And then you have to register in order. And then there's a add deadline and a drop deadline right when i was at cambridge they just say uh go to whatever lectures you you know here's a list of courses go to whatever lectures you want at the end of the year you have to pick at least four to take exams in you know if you wanted if you had a change of heart over christmas break and wanted to switch from analysis into algebra you could do that that was your problem and you know your job to solve but that freedom was left to you um and and then similarly at Bristol, when I was doing research, um, I really like my research advisor, but he, you know, we, we met a couple times at the beginning of the year. And then he sort of said, okay, uh, email me again when you have some ideas. Uh, and then I worked and I would email him, but that sort of meant that instead of meeting, you know, once a week or once every other week, like I do with my advisor here at Caltech, we were meeting once a month or once every other month. And so both worked just fine, but they are a little more hands off. Awesome. Well, thank you all for those perspectives. I think that's really useful for students who are looking into the Marshall and what study in the UK actually might look like. Um, I have one last question for you all. Then we're going to head to the Q&A sec section, which there are some questions for you there, but those are not my questions. My last one is, 
how has being a Marshall Scholar enhanced what you're doing right now or what you want to do in the end? I mean, what was, what is like the big benefit you can see to yourself professionally or personally um, that you receive from being a scholar? Dylan, you smile. You go uh, first. So, That's so, the only so way I'm going to pick. For me, uh, I have all these friends, um, both personal and professional, that I wouldn't have had if I hadn't have gone, right? So I know PhD students in my field at Oxford and Cambridge and who have um, spread across in, into continental Europe as well, who I simply wouldn't have met if I hadn't gone to Cambridge or Bristol. And now instead we text via WhatsApp every couple of months, you know, hey, Julian, what are you working on? Oh, I'm working on this and that. Um, and the same personally, right? So I will go back this summer to go to the model in Mayball because I have so many friends who are still there that I want to see. Um, that's the biggest benefit for me. Abby, Katie, what are your thoughts? Mm, I mean, I so I definitely, <laughs> I mean, so I didn't, I mean, I'd been, when I finished my undergrad, I'd realized that I really loved anthropology. I was really interested in political economy, and I almost felt like I hadn't had enough time to study those things in undergrad. And so the opportunity to kind of become a much more well-rounded social scientist, so I've got journalism, anthropology, political economy, I just feel like that creates a lot more opportunities for me professionally to go in a lot of different directions. And I'm not following a um, a sort of very conventional track. I'm, you know, in a country where the context is very, very different. Um, and, and some of the paths that would have been available to me in the States or the UK just, just aren't there. Um, but I think, so there's that sort of like, I just learned a lot of different ways of thinking about the world. But then I think along with that, just like a really exponential sense of possibility. And I think that came from I mean, like the first week that I met all the other marshals, I thought they were all going to be really scary and really smart and like way smarter than me and way more sophisticated than me. And they weren't. Everybody was really down to earth, really kind. Everybody was really smart and really cared about something, but it was not this like, you know, scary universe. And I found myself able to navigate different kinds of spaces with a lot more confidence. And I think you, you know, no one can ever take that away from you. Um, and I think just then meeting people who worked in so many different disciplines and from so many different backgrounds, both within my martial class and my classmates in my two courses. I mean, my friends from all over Europe, um, all the debates we had about whether the best way to change the world is to work in politics or to be an anarchist activist or to work at nonprofits or to be an academic. And like we all went and did the thing we thought we were going to do when we were 22, which is kind of hilarious. But, you know, just it's just um it just means that I'm sitting here and I'm saying, you know, 15 years down the line that like anything is possible. And I think the marshal really gave me that. I will echo what's been said. Um, I think professionally, it is really hard to overstate how much the Marshall Scholarship opens doors that are not available to you. Um, I mean, they're available to some people, but <laughs> to people again, who state school, no connections, um, the Marshall Scholarship is life-changing in a way that very, very few things are um, in terms of the kind of doors of elite institutions um, and prestigious positions and powerful institutions that it makes available to you, the network that it connects you to. Um, and the time um, to, it's exactly as Katie said, I think you at the end of undergrad are just beginning to figure out what it is that you're interested in. So having two years, to really dig into that lets you walk away feeling like, okay, I have a field. I feel like I am getting the lay of the land. I understand what it is I'm interested in and whatever you choose to do next. I think having those two years of extra academic experiences and time to think about all these things makes you confident of your direction heading in whatever place you go after the Marshall. Um, and then personally, I think one of the other benefits of the Marshall is it's true when you're told that um, you're off the treadmill for those two years, because at the end of the day, when you come back to the States or when you transition into grad school or another job afterwards, probably the resume value of the fact of the scholarship itself will be more important than anything that you do during your two years in the UK, which means you more or less have two years off to just be a person 
which is great. Um, if you have been working really hard for undergrad um, to achieve what it is you want to achieve. Um, and the, so in those two years, you can really pivot your focus on um, building relationships, building friendships, figuring out who you are, figuring out what you're interested in and what's important to you as a human being. Um, free from a lot of the pressures that I think you would feel otherwise. So um, yeah, I think personally the chance to like build the relationships that Dylan was talking about um, and get that understanding of yourself that Katie was talking about are all some of the biggest benefits of the Marshall. Well, thank you all so much for just that insightful conversation and just being able to share your experiences that can hopefully help some students on here who are prospective scholars go forward with their application process or maybe just give them some more guidance on what they want to do after their undergrad career. Um, I'm going to ask my colleague Josh Stanton from the embassy to turn his camera back on because we're going to turn to the Q&A session. Josh is there right away. Um, well, I'll give our panelists a little break from talking since you guys just spent the last 30 minutes talking. And I'm going to direct some questions to Josh. Then I'll probably bounce back to you guys right after the first question. So, Josh, um, my the first question is, it's actually about GPA. So we had um, someone chime in saying how they transferred to their current institution. Is the GPA requirement based on institutional GPA or a cumulative GPA? You're, you're muted, Josh. There you it is. After it was like bound to happen at some four point. Four years of pandemic, I would have learned mm -hmm. to unmute myself before talking. Um, so it is based off cumulative uh, GPA. So they would consider their full uh, undergraduate um, experience uh, when considering the GPA requirement. Now, awesome. the, the, the thing just, oh, sorry, just, just to add to this, um, there are exceptional circumstances where the committees may consider uh, a slightly lower GPA, or if you've had a particular, say, time during your university where you had a low GPA, if there was some sort of um, family emergency or sort of ex very sort of ex extreme extenuating circumstance that might explain um, uh, explain a, a particular period where, you know, you might've had a sort of a number of performance, uh, the committees do take that into consideration, but on the whole, it's the three, seven requirement. Great. Uh, one more admin focused question for you, Josh, how many recipients have already been in the workforce for like maybe one to two years before, um, applying for the scholarship? Uh, so that's a good question. So I don't know if we nest if the the Marshall Scholarship necessarily tracks that specifically. Um, I would say if I had to guess, just based off of the app. So most of the applications I see are in the D.C. region. Um, so that's uh, D.C., Maryland, Virginia, West Virginia, and Delaware. Um, I would say roughly of those, we probably get anywhere from fifteen to twenty percent are students that are sorry candidates that have recently graduated. Uh, and might be in the first or perhaps second year of their job. So um, what I tend to see a lot of times is folks who have kind of moved to DC, have gotten a job either working in the policy space or doing academic research or doing some sort of um, sort of post post undergrad job. Um, so I, I think just to say here, it's not uncommon and there's no, um, you know, whether you are a senior applying or a, a recent graduate, there's no weight given to either of those sort of um, situations. It's just really a question of the strength of your application and kind of what you've set out in terms of why I want to go to the UK, why it makes sense for my sort of academic and professional plans. Great. Um, I'm going to switch to two questions for the panel. So you, you don't you don't all have to answer this, but if you want to answer, just chime in. Um, so the first one is, how did you spend your time in the UK outside of your studies? So whoever wants to go first, feel free. Hmm. I got involved with music again. I used to play the clarinet in high school and a couple of my friends joined the orchestra at Sussex and they said, you should join. I said, I'm terrible. I'm way out of shape. But I went home at Christmas, got my clarinet, brought it back. And I loved making music again for a year and a half. It was wonderful. And again, like I had time, you know, to do that, which was great. I did a lot of hiking. I did a lot of Ryanair cheap flights around Europe to, you know, visit friends or see new places. Um, I did a lot of train travel around the UK to visit other Marshall scholars in different interesting places. Um, and I saw a lot of plays and ballets and things when I was in London because there were always cheap student tickets that were pretty affordable. 
Abby, I'm curious your thoughts. I mean, Dylan, I know exactly what you're going to say and you were there during the pandemic. So feel free to add anything else, but I, I'm curious Abby's too. Yeah, so um, so much traveling, so many Ryanair flights. We became experts at navigating all of the picky little <laughs> Ryanair requirements. Um, <clears throat> and then the train also makes it extremely easy to travel around. So that too. Um, so lots of hiking, lots of travel. Um, within the cities where I lived, um, I am involved in local churches, usually wherever I'm living. And so that was an incredible way to meet people of all different kind of stripes um, from all over the world. Um, and so I would, through that, do some like community engagement um, and volunteer work, too, in the places I lived, which was um, a really cool way to meet people kind of outside of the elite academic bubble, too. I started running um, my my house. I mean, it fit with the pandemic and some of my housemates were very serious runners and Cambridge outside of any external influences. I think that Cambridge is the my favorite city that I've ever lived in. If you get a chance, it's idyllic. I mean, it looks like a country village turned into a university town. So you go two miles in any direction and you're not in a city anymore. You're in fields and pastures and that's a really nice place to run. So that's what I did. Great. Uh, next question is about expenses. How did you guys find the scholarship was in terms of the financial support the, uh, the commission gave you? Did you need to supplement with any of your own funds and were you able to work while you're there? The working part is also something Josh could answer to after, but I want to hear all of your experiences before we let Josh wait. Hmm. Yeah, I, I've, it's been a long time, so I don't know how things are now. I found that my stipend pretty much covered what I needed, but not a whole lot extra. But I was also like in student mindset where I, I was doing everything I could as cheaply as possible. Like I didn't go to restaurants very much, but we cooked a lot at each other's houses and, you know, um, or got cheaper takeaways and things like that. It, it was enough that I could do, you know, traveling on the cheap, you know, staying at hostels and taking cheap flights around Europe. Um, I did work a little bit. I, my first year, got a job at a transcription company that transcribing research interviews, and it was just very ad hoc, like three hours here, two hours there, paid by the hour. I did have to get my like national insurance number in the UK so that I was allowed to do that. And then my second year, I did some consulting for an organization I had interned for after undergrad, and so that was, they were paying me in dollars. It wasn't a, a UK institution. Um, so I worked a little bit, but very, very little, like it wasn't, wasn't a lot. It wasn't a big part of my daily or weekly life, just a little bit here and there. Abby or Dylan. So I, my only job, I graded for the math department at Bristol. So, you know, it was less than a thousand pounds total, but I did on and off some work for them. And in general, I thought the finances were fine. I mean, you're not going to be. You're not going to be making money and stockpiling it for later, right? Don't don't get the wrong idea. Um, and you know, rent can be quite high. Um, and I, I did notice, right? So I think maybe part of this question was also about savings. So I went with a small savings. So the the one club issue, right, is that if you have if your salary is exactly the amount that you need, that doesn't include any savings bubble. And so when I went, I had a small savings account with you know say you know, three or $4,000 in it that just that I'd never needed. But several times it was good to know that I had because if the stipend was getting a little close, well, if I had some accident, then I, then I would have needed it. But in the end, everything was fine. Yeah, I agree that it, it covered what you need. Um, if you're living in London, which is, I think, the most expensive place to live in the UK, it, you're not going to be living in like the fanciest digs um, or the largest apartment, but um, always livable. And then I also had a part-time job. So I um, worked for a small government consulting firm back in the States. Um, and actually that I think a lot of scholars kind of did remote work for um, places that are based in the States. And I think that obviously take none of this and check all of this, but like, I think that makes the paperwork a little simpler. Um, because you don't have to do some of the registrations that you would have to do if you're working for a British employer. There is a limit on how many hours per week you can work. I think it's like 20, um, but you know, you shouldn't need to come anywhere near that. A lot of scholars did um, online tutoring. 
Some of them did help with college applications um, or scholarship applications or things like that. Uh, or yeah, so I think that's pretty common. And once you factor in some form of part-time job income, um, you're pretty quickly um, going to be doing just fine and out of any, I think, financial stress. There's also a fund, I believe, that the scholars have kind of set up as like an emergency support network. So for those of you who are coming in maybe without the savings account that Dylan mentioned, um, there are kind of some less official forms of support that the scholars have tried to set up for one another. Josh, do you have anything to add on that? Yeah, so I think Abby was absolutely right in terms of the specific hours. So when you're at university and during term, you're allowed to work under your visa up to 20 hours a week. Off term, you can work full time. Um, so particularly in that sort of year, that's you know perhaps like the summer between your first year and your second year, you can work full time. Um, but that's something that you would also, just to clarify, that was something you need to confirm uh, with your university, because the universities themselves will be your visa sponsor. So we those are the sort of the contemporary rules now. There's nothing to say that that may not potentially change by the time you, um, you know, begin your Marshall uh, scholarship in 2024. So again, as you're kind of applying and getting into the university, something for you um, for you to consider. Um, Abby also did mention there's something I think I believe it's called uh, Marshall uh, Plus, uh, and essentially it's a one-time stipend that the Marshall uh, the Association of Marshall Scholars, which is the alumni association of the scholarship, there's roughly about two thousand scholars in the community. Uh, the organization provides you with sort of a one-time grant that's not needed to be paid back, but it is intended to um, enhance. Um, the uh, the experience um, while you're there. So that is another potential option. Um, just sort of slightly connected to this, just as I mentioned, when you are applying for that school, something it is, uh, you know, confirming that with the university is something to think about. And just a, as a slight reminder, you do still have to apply separately for your first choice institution, even if you've been accepted in the Marshall Scholarship. So there's sort of a two-part process to that. Great. Well, I think this is a nice segue. And this is more for the alumni. I mean, during your summer, during your break, how have did you guys spend your time? Was it doing some of these work opportunities, any internships? I mean, how did you spend your, your time? Both of my partners Dylan. had their oh, sorry. Go ahead. I didn't see Dylan. Do you want to go? Dylan? No, he was just no, he was just, just smiling. Okay, I'll be <laughs> I'll go. Both of my universities had the dissertation due in September. So both of my summers I spent writing a dissertation. I didn't, um, I actually found that to be quite a consuming thing, but yeah, and also spending time with all my other friends who were writing their dissertations and doing a bit of travel and hiking and hanging out at Brighton Beach, et cetera. But I was mostly writing both of my summers up until September. So yeah, some of the programs the finished in June and people were more flexible there. Yeah. Yes, so this was exactly my case. So both of my programs finished in June. And so I was smiling because I have quite fond memories. British summer is lovely. Uh, put on a bucket hat and go outside, walk around Stonehenge, walk around Cambridge in the summertime. I got really great fun. Entirely goofy enough. And my summers also uh, had dissertations, but um, I also did part-time unpaid internships for uh, British nonprofits that I was really interested in that were in my field. So that's an option too. Great. Uh, the next question is about the ambassadorial aspect of the, uh, the application. What are some ways scholars explore and develop that potential in the course of their fellowship? I'm, I'm looking at you, alumni panel. Anyone wanna chime in first? So I, I spent Christmas and Easter while I was there because, of course, I couldn't leave the island uh, with with Brits. And so that was a lot of fun. And I think they enjoyed it, too, because they sort of, you know, had this foreign guest in their house who they could, you know, quiz about American culture. And and not even like that I'm an expert. I, obviously, I don't know any. I don't know the first thing about politics. right? But here they had a real life American who they, you know, what do you think about? beef jerky, right, or whatever you like. Um, and so really, I think, I mean, it's probably hard for the for the Marshall Commission to really measure how that stuff goes on, because really it happens naturally just when you move there, you make friends and talk to people and make those connections.
Abby, you want to go? Yeah, next? I'm just reflecting on it. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Abby. <laughs> Tell you, Katie. I was just reflecting on, sorry, sorry for the grumpy toddler in the background. So I was reflecting on what Dylan said. And I guess I think ambassadorial potential, you know, I understand the intentions of the founders of the scholarship in the British government. And I think that's really important. I also think it can be quite a scary term that is very intimidating. Um, and, you know, if you call it friendship, fellowship, connection, um, which really in some ways means the same thing. It's just about getting to know people across cultures and the kinds of experiences Dylan described and spending time in people's homes and families and um, connecting with, with people from the UK. And I think if you make a point of doing that um, through extracurriculars, through internships, through church, through a religious community, I think it's good to have something that takes you out of your university environment, like some of the, you know, things Abby's spoken about, um, you know, that's, that's where it comes from. And so I think it's, um, I would just encourage people not to be intimidated by that and feel like it means a strict um, foreign relations sort of definition of an ambassador. It's just about connections that will um, fuel thinking and relationship and understanding in different ways over time. And I'll be quick, but I do think- I may have misinterpreted, but- <laughs> I do think, um, I think in reality, those are a lot of the ways that you will manifest these connections is through personal ongoing relationships. I think for the application, you might have to tailor it a little bit differently because I think another helpful way to think of this question is what is your value proposition to the British taxpayers? Um, and very helpfully, my second master's in international relations focused on public diplomacy, which is kind of these informal ways that governments exercise power and the Marshall Scholarship is a very explicit example of public diplomacy. So we actually talked about it as an example in my master's program. Um, and it's helpful to conceive of this as like, it might seem a little bit um, instrumentalist to view the scholarship this way, but it is Britain trying to extend a positive view of Britain to future powerful Americans. Like that is what the scholarship is attempting to do. And so everything you can do to be like, I will have a positive view of um, Britain and I will keep that in mind when I am doing X, Y, Z important thing in the future. Um, that I think is the best way to conceive of. So like you can say the close relationships I'll build when I'm there in this institution, I will keep with me when I'm back in the US doing this important thing. I mean, I will make sure that Britain is portrayed positively and that the relationship between the two countries remains strong. So I think it's okay to really, that, that essay is when you can really try to conceive of the scholarship for what it um, in a way is, which is Britain trying to promote Britain's influence around the world and just lean into that and say, yes, I will be a great influencer for Britain in the future. Um, so that would be my advice on how to craft the essay. In reality, it's much more about like the personal relationships you'll build and sustain in the long term. Well, thank you for that. Um, we're nearing the end. So I'm going to do one more question. And I, this, the alumni on the panel might not be able to answer this necessarily. Josh may be able to, but maybe it's also just from experiences you guys have from talking to other alumni. I mean, how... how how generous are the UK universities in regard to any financial aid they can provide for their students? Maybe for someone who intends for a PhD whose first few years are covered by the Marshall, is there any logistical answer to that? I see Josh kind of wincing down there, so he might have like a technical answer. Um, I mean, I think it really does depend on the university. Um, to be quite honest with you, this is where so outside of the sort of the scholarship funding opportunities, this is then kind of just boils down to what those particular universities might be offering for specific programs. Um, I wouldn't say that there's like sort of a uniform level of financial aid that's provided to any American students wanting to uh, apply. What I would say generally is um, in most cases, uh, British universities do tend to be cheaper uh, financially to complete a degree than American universities. Some of this is boiled down to the simple fact that it's you can do a master's degree in one year versus two. Um, but I think the, the level of tuition rates is not nearly as high in the UK as it is uh, in, in the US. Um, there are universities um, that are very eager to get candidates to apply. And in, in, in a few cases, I know of at least one university that if they have a candidate who has at least made it to the interview round, but did not get 
a scholarship win, they still provide a uh, a financial uh, scholarship offer to students who have kind of reached that stage because they're very interested in getting, uh, again, at the end of the day, if you have interviewed and you still haven't got it, just to emphasize, like getting to the interview round is a huge uh, feather in your cap. Whether you get the scholarship or not, you should be very proud of the fact that you've gotten in the interview round. And these, these uh, universities, they know how competitive it is and they know they're getting excellent students um, in all aspects of the phases. So I wouldn't be necessarily discouraged if you don't get uh, the offer. But I do think, again, it boils down to doing your research, talking to the universities, seeing they, what might, they might be able to provide in terms of financial support, um, and then kind of also thinking about what you realistically can um, think you can save or can can um, look at in terms of other sort of other avenues for uh, supporting your finances or supporting your research as well. I, I don't know if it's helpful to add, it's just anecdotally like from my class, the people who stayed on for PhDs, I don't think anyone was paying for it out of their own pocket. So even after Marshall stuff was done, I don't think people were taking out big loans. I think people found different ways to finance it. Um, so that's just, a, it's not a sweeping statement, but that's just the case studies that I was aware of. And I guess I know in anthropology, the mean completion time in the States is eight years if you do a PhD in anthropology. And I think in the UK, people can consistently finish that in three, four, five. So also just the duration of PhD does tend to be shorter in many disciplines in the UK. Awesome. Well, thank you. Um, I'm going to ask one more question. This is more a question for me, and then I'm going to hand off to Josh to wrap this up. But is what's one thing you want the students on here listening to take away from this conversation? So I'd like to hear something from each of the panelists, but Josh, I'd also like to hear something from you from like the admin side of it. So um, Josh, I'm going to have you go first, actually. You're muted. All right. Well, either I tried. Um, again, I think the one thing maybe just to take away this uh, this can feel this like applying for national scholarships like this can feel like a lot. Um, and if at any point uh, it creeps into your mind that this is not for me or that like I'm not the person that they're looking for, stop right there because the answer is probably absolutely like is probably that it is absolutely not the case and this is for you. Uh, and again, just to reemphasize, I think. Having Dylan, Katie, and Abby here is a good um, sort of example of like, we really have, truly have scholars from every part of the country, every sort of academic interest. You know, we really value that and the committees really value that. So I would absolutely encourage folks to apply, even if you sort of have hesitations, um, you may find that your you bring something to your application and to the interviews that just absolutely inspires the committee members because they do want to kind of create opportunities for students to get these experiences in the UK. Um, I always use the example of a, we had an interview uh, with a girl who uh, I watched her uh, walk into the embassy and she looked absolutely terrified. And I'm thinking, oh my God, like she is so nervous. She could barely get a word out to me edgewise. She walks into her interview. It runs five minutes over time. I walk in after she's left to the interview committee and they're like, there's literally committee members who are crying because they said it was literally the best interview they had ever had with a candidate. And so uh, you may be in a position where you may think, hey, I don't know if I'm if I'm the right person. And then you walk in there and you totally blow the committees away. So absolutely apply, talk to universities and do give this give this uh, opportunity a chance. Thank you, Dylan. I'm going to start with you for the alumni. I'm just going top down yeah. for my screen now. And and I and I also I'm sorry I have to go in a moment. I have a seminar starting soon. Um, but I would I would I honestly I just want to echo what Josh said. If there's if you're wavering, uh, round up towards applying. Definitely, please apply um, because you will know until you do, and it might be very very nice. All right. Thanks, Dylan. Enjoy your seminar. Okay, Abby. Let's go to you. Definitely agree. I think the application process, like I said earlier, in and of itself is extremely valuable um, for starting to articulate what it is that you're interested in, what you want to do, finding the common thread between the things that make you excited um, and that make you interested in the work that you do. So I would recommend applying, um, not even for the outcome, just for the process itself. Thanks, Abby. Katie, close it out. <laughs> 
I echo that. I mean, I think also just to remember that I think sometimes we don't go for things because we put a lot of pressure on ourselves that if we don't get this, we're going to be to have failed. I mean, like I didn't get an internship at the New York Times. I didn't get an internship at the Boston Globe. I can tell you a bunch of things I didn't get for everything that I did. And so um, I think it's just um, I think the process of researching and understanding this whole world could open all sorts of other doors, even if one didn't get the Marshall Scholarship. Um, yeah, so I think also just to, there's so many pathways into an interesting and rewarding um, path. And this is one of many. And I think the process of considering and applying for it would just open more and more doors, regardless of the outcome. Thank you for that. Well, Josh, I'm gonna hand it off to you to close out the session. I unmuted myself. Um, <laughs> Uh, well, I just want to thank uh, Abby and Katie uh, and Dylan so much for taking the time um, from their busy schedules to participate. Uh, I want to thank everybody in the audience and all our students uh, who joined uh, for coming and taking the time to listen. Absol again, absolutely encourage you to go and talk to universities uh, to learn more information. Uh, we will make this recording available uh, on the embassy's uh, YouTube page. It's at UK in USA. Um, so look out for that. Um, we also uh, post a lot of content on not just the embassy's Twitter and Instagram, but also on our counselor accounts. So you can look out for that as well and visit the website, it's www.marshallscholarship.org. Um, so with that, thank you so much again. Hope you enjoy the rest of your, of your day. Hopefully it's a lovely one like it is in UC. Uh, and we will hopefully uh, see your applications on our desk soon. Thanks so much. Thank you all. Have a nice one.